Yeah, I'll do it in English tonight. Good evening, everybody. I hope you uh, had a safe and no traffic trip to the church, if it's possible for that to happen in Toronto on Friday. Um, we have the privilege tonight to have uh, our guest speaker, Ms. Uh, Donna Habenicht. She's coming to us from uh, Andrews University. She teaches there. She chairs the uh, Department of Psychology and Counseling, as I understand. She wrote a uh, few very interesting uh, books uh, that actually intrigued us and uh, interest, interested us in uh, inviting her to uh, come here, uh, spend the weekend with us, and uh, give us opportunity to learn, to become uh, better families, better individuals, better parents, maybe better husbands, better wives. So for tonight's presentations, uh, tonight's title is Living in the New uh, Technology World, something that's very uh, relevant to these days. Uh, if you want, uh, she prepared the handout for us. Whoever is willing to have one, Mladen uh, has enough copies. Uh, we'll give it to you so you can uh, follow presentation. Um, before we start, I would like uh, our head elder, uh, Milan Bolkovic, to come up here and have a word of prayer with us. And after that, we'll uh, give a, a pulpit to uh, Ms. Donna, and she's going to lead us through this presentation tonight. Thank you, Noah. Shall we stand for prayer? Our kind and heavenly Father, we thank you for the Sabbath day that's ahead of us. We thank you for leading us through the week behind us. And we thank you for the opportunity uh, to uh, learn about your will for us and about how we can be better parents, better people, better spouses. Um, Lord, we ask that you be with us, bless us, help us to see the things that we need to see and feel the things that we need to feel. And please bless the speaker so that her words can uh, be your words and your words can be her words. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What's happening? Yeah. PowerPoint doesn't show down there. Well, good evening. I'm very happy to be here with you. I am sorry that the plane was late and my luggage was the last one to come off of a very big flight with many people. <laughs> and so I was delayed in getting here. I'm sorry about that. And you are very patient. And I congratulate you for that patience. I also congratulate you for coming on a Friday evening. Uh, after a long week of work, I'm so happy to see you. Uh, we have perhaps one of the, I, I can't say one, pre, one pre talk is, is, is uh, more important than another. But in today's world, living in the new technology world, is very important for each of us. Uh, things have changed dramatically in just a short time. So what do I point to to get anything to move here? Up there. Uh, I'm not sure. I, ha I haven't got the technology straight here tonight either yet. How do I get anything to move? Do you like that? Okay, here we go, here we go. No, we went, tw we went two. Well, let's see if we can make it do one. Ha, here we go. Now, our number one priority as parents, the responsibility of parents is not toward their children's happiness, but toward what? Talk to me. 
I like audiences that talk to me. This is an active type of thing. Uh, I'm not going to lecture my way all the way through it. We're going to do this together. <laughs> so, the biggest responsibility we have is toward our children's character. If we do that well, they will be happy. Happiness will come along. But it is certainly the most important thing we can do. In developing a strong Christian character, there will be moments when your child will be very unhappy with you because they don't want to do what you know they should do. But you will hang in there because you know the goal and you know where you are going. Over the last 30 years, I have studied, done research, and dialogued with many graduate students. I taught in the master's and doctoral programs at Andrews uh, in educational and counseling psychology. Uh, many families who have attended my seminars in the last 30 years, I've talked with many of them. I bring to this also my experience as a parent, as a teacher, as a grandparent. Uh, within the last month, I had a wonderful privilege. We had a great privilege to have all of our family together. Uh, we did a houseboating trip. And we have two children, a boy and a girl. And they each have two children. Uh, the grandchildren are all millennials. They range in age from 23 to 29. And uh, all of them are married, except one, the oldest one, who unfortunately her husband decided to just walk away and live a different kind of lifestyle. So she's alone now. So we have been through quite a bit as a family. And we have seen what happens to the second generation and to the third generation. All of those things matter a great deal. Technology obviously dominates our world. In the last five years, it has become the thing that all of us do. How many of you own a smartphone? Well, see. You don't just have cell phones anymore. You have smartphones that do all kinds of things for you and that can occupy a great deal of your time and can be a very great convenience. And the middle picture there is the picture of a grandson of one of my friends. And at the time this picture was taken, he was two years old. He's playing on a tablet. It's very easy to work on a tablet and punch pictures. And we'll talk much more, more about that later. Because when he's working on that tablet, playing on that tablet, punching pictures, he is not developing the neural connections in his brain that he's supposed to be developing at that time in life. Uh, so these are some of the important things we are going to look at tonight. God has some words for us from the Holy Scriptures. I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. Let's think about that a minute. Wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. And yet I have heard people say, well, unless you try it out, you don't know. You don't know what it's like. But God's word to us is, let's be innocent about the evil. And let's be very wise about what is good. 
And I think that's what we really want for our children. Let's see. So the first thing we want to do is to protect our child's mind. How many of you here have children? I have to see who's here, okay. How many of you have children who are younger than five years? Okay. And how many have children who are five to 11 or 12? Okay. Teenagers? Oh, we have, oh, we have a nice variety tonight. <laughs> That's good. We have all the ages. Although there are more people with the five to 12 than, than either the other the other. Uh, size of it. All right. So in protecting our child's mind, what we need to do is, I'll get, I'll get this system working yet. First of all, we need to input positive messages. Think about inputting positive messages into our, kids, our children's minds. Remember, you'll be wise about what? Good and Innocent about evil. So, in protecting our children's mind, the first thing we want to do is input positive messages and protect from viruses. Now, tonight is a workshop, uh, as opposed to my lecturing all the time. And so, uh, right now, I would like you to talk with at least two other people near you. And talk a little bit about how you are inputting positive messages into your child's brain. The posit let's, let's look at the positive ones. So let's take about four or five minutes to do that. So find some people who are close to you, three or four of you together, uh, and talk about how are you inputting, what are you doing to input positive things into their brains. Time is yours. Thank you. 
We have about one minute. We have about one minute to finish. All right, are you ready to share? Uh, let's have each, I said there are four groups it looks like, we've formed into four groups. And so let's have each group give us uh, three or four, maybe a maximum of three things on their list. So, and when the next group comes along, then you can't repeat those. You have some different ones. See how far we get with it. <laughs> you wanna go first? <laughs> Oh my. Well, since you worked so hard to get me here, maybe I will let you go first tonight. How about that? Okay. All right. Let's hear, let's hear your, your three things, ways of inputting positive things into your child's brain. Could you stand up and then everybody will hear you better? 
Thank you. Uh, maybe you need to turn around so they can see you, and then and then it will be. And there is a microphone. That's what we need. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay. Uh, spend quality time in their interest. Uh, quality uh, time. Challenging the kids. Okay. Are you supposed to try? Uh, okay. Go. Are you okay? Sorry. Okay. So we said that the first thing, uh, in order for us to put any positive messages, we have to be positive in order to uh, be able to transfer that to the kids. Uh, spend uh, quality time in, with the kids. Then uh, find what good interests that they have and spend time with that as well. That's enough. You've done three now. Oh, good. So that's it. <laughs> okay. Next group. Who's next? Who's here? Do you have three things that you have, would like to add to it? Let's go quick. No, seriously. Well, now you see, some of those things they said were very general. Spend quality time with your kids, but what's quality time? What do you do in quality time? You could be naming off what you do in quality time. I think we talked about generating always a positive atmosphere. Yes. Actually generates um, good input. What was the other thing? We talked about, uh, oh, just being here. So being an example, um, showing positive priorities in your life. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, kind of living what you preach as well. And, and I think we also talked about reading and, and singing and uh, repeating positive stories, positive experiences, something that they'll actually start remember, remembering because you're repeating it so often. Children do watch what we do. Mm -hmm. Okay, next group. What would you like to add to that? Okay, we have only one thing to add so far. Just to recognize good things they do. Praise. To praise them. You praise them for the good things. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. Some more? Do you want to add some more? Okay, who else can add some more to that list? <laughs> Oops. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, controlling their senses. That means what they hear, what they see, what they, what do they read, taste. read, taste. So controlling their senses, mm -hmm. um, reading to them, mm -hmm. what else? Behaving good in front of them. Okay, so they say your example, and you read to yeah. them and you control what goes into their different senses, okay? Yes. Well, you, have you gotten some ideas about what we can do to input positive messages? There are many other specific things we could have said. There are lots of specific ways of inputting positive things to kids. And uh, that's, I think, the first place to start, right? Input the positive. So think, as you go through your day, is this an activity? Am I inputting positive stuff into my kid's brain? What am I doing? What are we doing that inputs positive things? Because they don't want to talk just about, you know, we don't want the negative stuff. We want to talk about how we put in the positive things too. And that's very, very important. And as you've just mentioned, um, let's skip to, let's go to number nine. Nine, please. Mm, yes. All right. The input to the brain, as somebody already mentioned, comes through the senses. There are 12 cranial nerves. My husband, who is a physician and was for 25 years a pediatrician, uh, tells me that there are 12 cranial nerves, and it's through those nerves that we get all the input into the brain. Now. Vision, what we see inputs into the brain. Keep these in mind because they're very important when we look at what's at technology. What we hear inputs into the cranial, into the brain. What we feel, what we taste, what we smell, and the list goes on. 
And so each one of these has a potential for inputting positive or inputting negative. So, now let's look at brain, brain input. And I'm just going to dash through these. We're going to put them up as fast as they'll come up. And I'm sure you can add more to this list. And what else could you have added to it? That's a lot of inputting, isn't it? Do you think all of those things input into the brain? In one way or another, they do. The neighborhood you live in, including the people who are around you. What happens in your neighborhood? Um, toys and games, the room decorations that your kids have. I mean, your kids spend quite a bit of time in their room. Room decorations are important. The billboards you go by when you're driving. Inputting into the brain. God's word in the church. And we could have put the school on, the schools on there in general. But there's the web, the iPhone, the iPad. There's all kinds of things that input into the brain. So let's take a look. <laughs> brain input, more brain input. We're going to run through a few facts uh, fairly quickly here. By the age of 20, most kids have seen more than a million commercials. Who writes commercials? Who designs commercials? People who know how to persuade you, right? That's their business, the how to persuade you to do what they want you to do. That's a significant input into brain. Kids today spend more time with the media and technology than in school, according to recent research, 2012, from the Kaiser Family Foundation. They estimate that the average child from 8 to 18 years of age spends 10 hours and 45 minutes a day of screen time entertainment, not school screen time. So what has a screen? Tell me. We're, we're going to talk about screens a lot. What has, what has screens? Pardon? Facebook comes on a screen, doesn't it? comes on a computer screen. So that includes all the time we spend on computers. What else has a screen? Yeah, the video games. Mm -hmm. They all come on a screen. Your cell phone, your smartphone has a screen. The TV has a screen. And when you start adding these up, you can get, kids get, can get 10 hours and 45 minutes a day of screen time entertainment quite fast. That's more time than they spend in school. So this is a very significant input into brain. Yes? This is a, an, a, key, a key, an interesting thing. It's a very interesting thing because most of the, res the research that I have read recently shows very clearly that kids spend much more time on the internet than their parents think they do. Like twice as much time as their parents think they do. They're not aware of how much time it really is. This is very significant in terms of influence. Yes? No, this is, this is screen time. Doing something with a screen. You remember, we, we mentioned several different kinds of screens. Doing something with a screen. It's screen time. But it's still entertainment. Is it what they do research? Well, that, this, this, yeah, but, this, but this, this particular number of 10 hours and 45 minutes is screen time entertainment. Uh -huh. but yeah, yeah, that does not include school. Okay, I thought that was Yeah, no, it's screen time entertainment. Kids from 8 to 18 years of age. 
<laughs> yeah, I do. You say, how many hours are there in the day? Isn't it amazing? Yeah. And what can we say? <laughs> you think, well, there aren't that many hours in the day, but there's much more, many more hours than you think there are when you get right down to it. You know, there are 24 hours in a day, okay? How many hours do your children sleep? At least eight. Depending on their age, of course. But most school-age kids don't sleep 12 hours a day. There's a lot of time in there. Two hours a day of screen time is what's recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics. Two hours a day of screen time altogether. And it's because looking at screens has a different effect on your mind than looking at a book and looking at other kinds of things. And that's their, their recommendation is no screen time before the age of two to three, depending on the child. No screen time at all. And yet, the advertisers would have you believe that your baby needs these games that come up on the screen. No, your baby does not need those <laughs> at all. Uh, that's their recommendation is no screen time before two, preferably before three. And it's because of brain development and the establishment of the neural connections in the brain that get, they do not get established. They, they are primarily established in a positive way through real live interaction with people and with things that they're doing in their lives, not with a screen. <laughs> But forget about them. They do not do your baby any good, any good at all. Your baby is much better off in this because a baby is establishing the neural connections in their brain that are not, they're not, their brains are not born fully mature. And so they're establishing these neural connections. And uh, all that screen time is negative toward the neural connections that you want them to have. So forget the advertisers. <laughs> uh, it's easy enough to, and there was a picture of one of those little kids I showed, it's easy enough to keep punching something on an iPad. Baby is not learning the kinds of things he needs to learn at this point in his life where we're establishing the neural connections in his brain for the rest of his life. Uh, so don't pay attention to the advertisers. Do your thing. <laughs> I can, I, let, let me get a little closer okay. to you. Um, if, if babies mm -hmm. uh, do have a lot of screen time, that um, some people are trying to connect it to attention deficit disorder. Now, there are people say, who are trying to connect that. Would you agree with that or not really? Um, I, the connection as far as I have, I can tell from reading the research so far, is not quote, established scientifically. But I think there may be something to it that they may eventually establish. Okay. Because screen time is ultimately like this sort of thing. Yeah. And there may, that may turn out to be. But I don't have the, you know, we don't have yeah. the, the current really strong evidence, cause-effect evidence. Yes. Uh, but it could easily be. Well, let's look a little bit at more brain input. Brain input, the web. You do know that the prediction is that, that by 2025, 20, most people will be wired with some device underneath their skin and be constantly in contact with the web. That's the prediction. I hope, I mean, I'm not going to have one of those things. <laughs> I hope not. 
<laughs> but that's the prediction for the future of the web since we're celebrating the 20th, 5th anniversary this year of the web. Um, I went into a number of different things like that. Okay, no solo web until at least 10, preferably 12 years of age. They should not be on the web by themselves until that age. Why? They, they, they can't make, they don't have the judgment. And there's anything and everything there. Um, when you spend, a, when a person spends a great deal of time surfing, quote, surfing the web, this is what happens. The web develops disconnected thinking. Because a child who spends a great deal of time doing this sort of thing uh, ends up, uh, you know, you go here and then you're over there somewhere else, you go to someplace else, you don't like that, you move around here, you do this. Okay, that's the way you begin to think. And when kids spend a great deal of time doing this, then they lose their ability to really have connected thought and to pursue a topic. Uh, you know, diligently and so forth. Uh, they get very upset. They, they just want to just do this. And it's because they've trained their brains that way. Kids and adults can't concentrate who spend a great deal of time on the web, surfing the web. Now, surfing it is one thing compared to, uh, for example, um, I go to the American Psychological Association, Association website to identify research in a particular area and I want to read this article. I'm not jumping around. I have a, I have a purpose to find a, a specific thing and I sit there and I read this article that I find. But most people, uh, kids in particular, tend to surf. You know, here, there, this type of thing. Then we have the problem that comes up of predators and online relationships. And there are many, many kids, particularly late, uh, late grade school, even sixth and seventh graders, uh, ninth and tenth graders, who have agreed to meet somebody, a man they have, do not know and their parents don't know anything about. Somebody they met online. Um, we need to be educating kids, really educating them seriously, that you don't just go out to see somebody you met online without an adult with you. The risk is too great, positively too great. From what we know about how the brain develops and uh, the judgment and so forth, probably it would be best that kids don't have smartphones until 15 or 16. There's a significant change in judgment around 16. There's a maturity that kicks in that is not there at 13 and 14 even. Uh, and now that doesn't mean to say that they can't have a cell phone. That's a different story. Uh, we have, um, I'll explain a little bit about this so it makes sense to you. About 25 years ago, one of my former graduate students uh, called me one day and she said, uh, by the way, parenthesis, she had come from a very dysfunctional family and had undergone a lot of psychiatric work and a lot of counseling and so forth as a result of it. She called me and she said, my psychiatrist thinks that I need a resident mother. Would you be my resident mother? Her parents lived in far away and she had no relationship with them. So I agreed to be her resident mother. So for about 25 years, uh, she has really been part of our family. 
My husband and I were the parents at her wedding. Uh, we have done all the family functions that, that parents do with this woman. And she has a child today who is 14. Uh, this child does not have a smartphone. She has a cell phone. And it's important that she have something to communicate with because she spends one week with her mother and one week with her father. They're divorced. And communication is an important key issue for, for her. But she has a regular cell phone with prepaid minutes that she must buy herself. She's very careful how she uses those minutes. Yeah. <laughs> when you're paying for them, you're very careful about how you use them. <laughs> uh, and so forth. So, you know, there are other ways of handling this. You can have communication without putting the internet in a child's hands which is what a smartphone does for all practical purposes. Well, let's see what other shocking things we can learn. The research indicates to us that, in general, Kids by the end of elementary school have seen over 100,000 acts of violence. And that number has kept creeping up because games and many things show more violence today than they did five years ago. They're just, they're just getting more and more violent. And that's why this 100,000 has that plus there, because we don't know for exactly what it is now, but it's much more, it's considerably more than that. Uh, what happens to a child who sees a great deal of violence? Pardon? Well, they can, be, they can become addicted to it. They can also become very frightened of life in general. And, if, if, and when you become addicted to seeing violence in all your games, almost all the games have violence. I mean, basically, I won't say 100%, but pretty much all, most of them do. Uh, why you become, in effect, addicted to this violence. And you think that violence, violence is a thing that draws you for a lot of people. Here's another one that's quite interesting. There are many, many ads on TV, and they pop up even on the internet, about junk <coughs> foods. Junk food ads aimed at children and teens. Notice this. The proportion of fitness ads to junk food ads, 20 years ago, was one fitness ad the 26 junk food ads. Then it went to one fitness ad to 48 junk food ads. And today it's more or less 1 to 130. Now you wonder why your kids don't want to eat the good stuff? They're exposed to very much of this. This is powerful. These people know how to change your mind. Children under the age of 8, because of their mental development, stage, accept advertising and all programs as fact, as real life. That mental change doesn't occur until around seven to eight, somewhere in there, for most kids. And so think about that. Think about what the young, younger kids are looking at. Advertising, any programs, in fact, are viewed as real life until that, about that age, when their mind grows up a bit more. Well, let's look at brain input in screens. We talked about screens. Uh, lots of time in front of screens affects reading skills, and it affects eye movements. Let's talk about that. 
in order to read well, you need to move, those of you who, when you read, you're not conscious of it because you learned that. But you, you must move your eyes along, okay? Screens have a tendency to make your eyes fixed. And so kids who spend a great deal of time on screens have a problem developing these eye movements that are needed for reading, which is a continuous changing and moving along. A lot of time on screens affects kids' posture. Now, we're very concerned about this in business, aren't we? That the people who work in business sit properly and that they, they bring in experts to look and see how we sit and, and you know, so on and so forth. Nobody does that for kids. And so they sit however they want to sit. And they're looking at screens. It affects their physical growth. Because, why? Why do you think it affects their physical growth? They're not exercising. They're not outdoors doing other, thing, other kinds of things. They're sitting there. And there's something very interesting that most people don't know. For a child to develop the maximum intelligence that they're born with, the intellectual level that they're actually born, the potential they have to develop that, uh, the child must have, must combine, and must have exercise. The total intelligence that a child is born with does not develop when there's very little exercise, physical exercise. The two go hand in hand to, get the, to, get, to develop the brain. Isn't that interesting? Most people don't, don't know that. Uh, so in order to, for your kid to develop the intellectual potential they were born with, they need a lot of exercise. Um, that turns out to be very important, yes. How much per day uh, is necessary for their brain development? How much do they need? Okay. Uh, young children, very young children, preschoolers, need to be active most of the day. And when you start to school, then, you need, then, it, then it begins to get more limited. But we're, we're talking at minimum of two to three hours of physical activity. So get out and exercise with them. Do something physical active. Because otherwise, they'll come home and guess what they'll do? They follow their inclination, they'll turn on a screen <laughs> and sit there and watch it. Any kind of movement, yeah, any kind of movement counts. It's not, like, it's not like, well, you know, you have to break a sweat, you have to do this, but any kind of movement counts. And, and part of that movement must be outdoors because it's nature connected, it's outdoor connected. It isn't just walking around my house inside. It needs to, you, need to, you need the fresh air and, and the kinds of things. And that's harder to come by in the city than it is in some other areas. But, but that's what you need, uh, is the combination of nature, activity, physical activity for part of it. But, you know, cycling is, is active. There are lots of things a person can do that are, that are physically active. Screens affect, as we've been talking about, intellectual growth and problem-solving ability because of this tendency to go jumping around. They also affect social skills. Because why? All you're doing is looking at the computer and talking to the computer. What about eye-to-eye -eye contact, which is what social skills are about? They don't get it. So, you know, we're living in a, in a very challenging area. There's a lot of wonderful things that technology brings to us. But then there's a downside. And so as parents, we're in this very challenging time in which we want to help our kids 
the very best we can. Would you go to 34, please? Um, the one before that. That's 35, 34. Okay. So, as a result of all of this, what, what do we need to be? We need, we need to be active, informed, and vigilant parents. I love this little cartoon, don't you? If you're just doing homework, why do I hear explosions and screams? <laughs> so we need to be active. We need to be informed and we need to be vigilant. And don't be afraid to say no. So let's look at tech control, which is mostly on your handout here, so you can, you have that. We can look at it very briefly. Set family rules for screen time. That's you, you're the parent, you're in charge. If you didn't get a handout, why there's, there are some there. Post family rules for appropriate activities online. Establish tech-free zones in your home that ban the use of technology. Number one suggestion for that is when you eat. No technology when you eat. Eating is time to talk and interact and become connected as a family. And it's amazing how many of those messages can actually wait. You don't have to be looked at. We as adults can get pretty, pretty uh, tied in and uh, think we have to answer every little thing that comes in the moment it comes in, too. Yes? We're, sorry. When we're talking about technology, even the home phone is fair game, right? Like answering the home phone at dinner time, I find disruptive. Whether it's a smartphone or a home phone. Or whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there you, as a family has a right to have some time together without all those interruptions. And believe me, my, my, my thing is, I, 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 what shall I say? I had this little argument almost, almost constantly with my husband. He was a pediatrician, remember? And so he spent all these years uh, tied to his phone, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And I kept saying, honey, you're not a pediatrician anymore. It doesn't matter. You don't have to answer that phone. And the truth is that if something important, they'll leave us a message, <laughs> et cetera, you know. Um, but that's right. And so my suggestion is that for the benefit of the family, you may not eat together at noon because kids are in school and all that sort of thing, but at least your evening meal. Everybody together, and it's a no-tech zone. For that, so people can connect. And, of course, we have to set a good example. And we have to get the kids moving and move with them. We just talked about that. Uh, we need to set family rules for cell phones. Collect everybody's phones before bedtime. This is the recommendation today. Because so many kids, particularly teens, stay up late with their phones. And then they lack sleep. Most teenagers today do not get enough sleep. Most kids don't get enough sleep. So collect the cell phones before bedtime with the clear understanding that you are going to review what has happened today. As a concerned parent, you have a right to do this. This is the new technology world we live in. So we've just acquired new responsibility, which I didn't have when I was raising my kids. <laughs> Don't.
didn't have those things. Question on that? Yes. So Announce this ahead of time. This is what's going to happen. And this is the way it's going to be. Okay. So I have one at the age of 16, and then 20, 21, well, and that's it, I guess. Um. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, suggestion, so. my suggestion is that, that this applies until a person goes away to college, through high school. And by then, hopefully, they know what, they should, what they should be doing with these, with these gadgets. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. or, or and anyway, you're not in control anymore. They're out doing, doing their thing. Or maybe as long as I'm paying for the account. Oh, if you're paying for the account, then that's another story. <laughs> that's another story. We have, we have one more. I also read that turning it off, well, like at least an hour, taking away the screens before kids go to bed. Oh, to, yes. To have their brain, give them time yeah. to, to the shut down. The brain decompresses. That's good. Very, very definitely to try to turn the whole thing off an hour before bedtime. Add that to your list there. So I think sometimes we talk about what to do for kids. I, I think it actually is, is us that are changing as parents as well. Mm -hmm. Very that much we so. We ourselves can't. <laughs> but as parents, it's hard to follow these same set of rules, you know? And I yes. Think, um, kind of being a family unit in that, you know, encouraging all, each other to do all those same things is just as important. Yeah, yeah it's definitely something for everybody. Um, this book is, is recommended at the end of your, it's on, on the end of your handout sheet, The Big Disconnect. And uh, this is all about technology today. And it's very, very well done. Uh, and with many, much quotes, quotes, a lot of research said very nicely, you know, for the general public, not, doesn't read like a research journal. Uh, and a lot of very positive suggestions for how to cope and what to do uh, with the different things that are, that are happening. Because in here, she interviewed 2,000 young people, late grade school and then into high school, um, like, like fifth, sixth on up. And those kids came through very, very strongly upset with their parents and how their parents spent all their time on their smartphone. And they could never get, the kids could never get to their parents because the parents were all the time answering their smartphone. They couldn't have a conversation with the parents because the parent was interrupted by all their messages and all their texts that came through. This thing is a two-way street. Definitely a two-way street. Let's see. Did we get this thing turned off? OK. Uh, so put limits on the time of, on the computer and the internet. Do not allow your kids to have a TV in their room. There are all the professional organizations related to kids make this recommendation. If you're, uh, when, when your teens are going to be on social networking sites, teach them how to use it wisely. You know, actually sit down and teach them how to use it wisely. And you're going to want to check all co movies for content and ideas also. Now there we go. Uh, another thing that is positive thing to do is to increase family activity and talking time. Uh, that take, makes an effort on our part. We have to get off of our technology to do it. <laughs> and create, if you, if you would like, some families like to have a family movie night once in a while, and that way they can show they can all look together at good movies, of which there are a number of them out there. 
we need to think in terms of balance. No, that's not the right one. That, well, well, let's, we'll skip that. We, well, maybe we'll look at it just quickly. Um, that moved me to the next slide without going through all of these other ones. Just hit the next one, which is 38. No? Okay. Um, not sure why the slide I'm looking for is not on here, but I'm going to, not here. I'm going to, t I'm going to uh, tell it to you. Uh, this was not my idea. I think it's a wonderful idea, and I have practiced it for years without ever seeing it in print anywhere until very recently. What we need is balance and renewal. Take a weekly digital Sabbath. No TV, no games, no net, no smartphone, no iPad except for Bible study for adults, teens, and children. Take a weekly tech Sabbath. This recommendation uh, came from an organization that does a great deal of work with children and youth from Barna. Are you familiar with Barna? Some of you are. Uh, you can go to barna.com and they have a lot of wonderful suggestions and right now they are talking, they are writing a lot about millennials, you know who they are, and their tech habits. Uh, now for many years I have shut my computer off uh, and left it off for 24 hours. Uh, whatever is on there can wait. Oh, okay. Millennial, millennials in general are defined as people in their 20s. A little bit late. You no, know, 20s to about 30 to 31. Some in, that's the age that they're, that they're talking about. Uh, and, uh, and so I like the idea of a digital Sabbath, a digital rest. That's how they put it, a digital Sabbath. Don't have a day of rest from, from the technology. And what that does is it recreates your mind and it makes it so different that you actually feel renewed. You have, you have a, a balance of renewal. And if your family is still addicted, so they can't put it away for anything, turn off the TV and the online connection until you develop personal connections with each other. Then turn it back on again. Uh, can you take me to 40? Be a parent who loves enough to say no. Be a parent who cares enough to require accountability. Be a parent who loves enough to put your kids before your iPhone friends. Be a parent who cares enough to be available. That's the big complaint of kids in all the surveys is their parents are not available to them. They're too busy on their iPhone, on their, on their smartphone. And they can't even converse with their parents and say two or three sentences what, the, oh, I've got, I have a message. Let me, let me get this message first. We have to be available. We have to control our tech habits also. Remember what we started with? I want you to be, oh, pardon me, I'll then get that one. I want you to, that you can't really see that. I want you to be wise 
about what is? What are we supposed to be wise about? The good. And innocent about what is? Evil. God has a promise for families. And I like this promise very much. I will contend with those who contend with you and your children, I will save. The great promise. I hope that today, tonight, you are going home with some new ideas, some new information about tech, and some courage to control it so that it can be a positive influence in our lives. Now, any questions now? Yeah, I have a question. When you mentioned uh, uh, content, I really liked when you said ideas in whatever the media uh, they're exposed to. Um, when I look at, you know, what's made for kids today, in my opinion, I see lots of aggression and lots of violence. Um, and usually, if you object to something like that, I have a boy who is five, five and a half. There is always, I get this notion from people because I have a boy, where people say, well, they're boys. And my question is, like, how, like, how far do you go to that extent, let's say for the boys specifically, like, is it really that much different that they need to see all of this, you know, uh, stuff that's, in my opinion, it's very uh, aggressive. It's not maybe pure violence, but the ideas are not that great either. You know, in our church, we have one guy who is into uh, media, animation and stuff. He quit his job, basically. He lost his job because he didn't want to participate in making of a Batman uh, animation or mm -hmm. movie. And uh, like, how much weight this statement, the boys are boys, has, and to which extent would we make difference between boys and girls, and that boys have to be like, I don't understand why they have to be aggressive. I, I can understand that they have to be manly in the future, but uh, like, I can't okay. make out really. Um. Boys will be boys is usually an excuse because we don't want to think beyond that. Uh, men, boys are born, most of them, and, and grow up, most of them, being more vigorous, more active, more all these kinds of things than most girls are. It's, it's in their nature. And I, I think it's an excuse that we hear too often today for wanting to influence what happens in their lives, for wanting to lay down some rules. Boys need rules also. And it is not particularly good for them to watch all the violence, any more than it is for girls. The, you know, the data show that very clearly. So what kind of guideline maybe you would set, let's say, if they're watching a movie or a cartoon or an, like anything, any kind of uh, exposure to media that they have, like is, is there some kind of guideline that you could give that would help us, you know, so to say, well, this is, this is okay or this is not okay? Well, the, the, the problem we're facing today is that uh, everything, the movies, have more violence in it than they used to. By actual counts, the movies have more violent scenes than they used to. Everything, everything has more violence in it. Um, is violence something that we want for our children, boys or girls? Is that what we want them to have? A man can be a man, defend his family, be the leader in his family, without being violent. 
Are you hearing me? Mm -hmm. not what, what, we, what, what we want to do to begin with. A manly man doesn't have to be violent. How do you gauge the amount of violence the kid is seeing? Is that what you're asking? Well, what, what is too much? What is too much? Most, most of it is too much. It is extremely prevalent today. Things that did not have violence before have them. Almost every game has violence in it. Almost every movie has violence in it. And on down the line, that was not the case five years ago. Things have changed very sharply. Mm -hmm. This is biblical. He was watching David and Goliath, and he's impressed with Because there's this big guy, and David just comes and, you know, he, you know, takes care of him. And then, and sometimes he even, you know, uh, tries to make Goliath something better than he is. And then you look at that, and then kids, they want toys like swords, and they, they want to imitate that. And my question is, is that normal? let's say four or five years old, is a sword normal toy for them? Should we say no to that? Or it's normal for them to act out? I think, I think four and five year olds, three, four and five year olds, it's normal to act out. Quite normal. You know, and, and most kids that age who, who hear Bible stories love playing David and Goliath. Even if it's violent? Even if it's what? If it's violent. It, that's the way those Bible stories are. And they play them, and they play them, and they play them. Uh, and in time, I think that they come to an understanding of why those stories were there and what God was doing through those stories. That doesn't always happen when you're three and four. Mm -hmm. But it does happen. Because there is a purpose, and there is. There's a great deal of violence in the Bible. So no question it, it, about it. There were many, yeah. many stories in there about war. Mm -hmm. So in that sense... But, you don't, but we don't need to necessarily emphasize those all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are many stories about war there. No question about it. But every single story in there is not, in the Bible, is not necessarily appropriate for young children. Well, I think I'm, I'm just building on what Novo was saying, sure. and correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I see a difference between watching violence and uh, when kids use their imagination from hearing stories, seeing, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. let's say stuff in their books or whatever, and they're playing things out. I think that's almost healthy, in my opinion. I, again, I yeah. have no idea. <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. um, to some degree, of course. And, um, but it's different when you're just sitting there and watching the violence. Yeah, it, it is different. There's no question about it. And I think for me, the phrase men will be men in that sense is completely different because you also um, do want them to go through those stages where they are using their imagination and playing with other mm -hmm. boys and being active. Yeah. But watching it is a completely different That's a level. totally different story. Yeah. And they don't need to watch the kind of violence that is becoming more and more violent in games, in, in movies, in programs, yep. which is becoming more and more so. Any other questions before we end? I don't know that we'll solve all of the questions, but at least we can address them. <laughs> we can try.
<laughs> I remember when we had, when uh, one of our grandchildren, uh, boy, was about, I don't know, four or five years old. His parents had read a lot of Bible stories to him. And, uh, and he was reading, they were reading through a series of five books for children that begin at the beginning and they end with the new earth, the, the end of the world, and, and God makes things new again. And uh, at one point why in the story, there is a story from the beginning of the Bible early on about uh, a tree with fruit that God had told them they could not eat, touch. And, and the story goes on, and, and Eve, the woman, uh, in this early stories of the Bible, goes to there, and she is about to touch this fruit. And what does this, the, my grandson do, our grandson do? He shuts his, uh, his, throws his hands over his ears, and he says, no, no, I don't want to hear it. I know what's going to happen. She's going to take the fruit, and it's going to change everything. And indeed, it did change everything, according to the Bible story. And he was very tuned in to what was going to happen. Uh, so, you know, they, they pick up a lot of things like this. So say you have a family that, at this point, um, the children are very techy. They all have, they have phones. They have high, high screen hours. And do you suggest going kind of cold turkey right away and changing everything, let's say, to these principles? Or is there a way to cut down where the children become, aren't um, resistant or it, like it's a more natural reverse back to less technology? You know, I didn't make up all these principles. They came from very reliable sources of individuals who are very well known uh, for their work in this field and the principles are there because this is what should be happening to kids so for their benefit. So do you suggest, let's say someone is on one extreme end of the spectrum, their children are getting tons of screen time, they have no regulation, do you go all the way to the other extreme, to the good extreme essentially, and take away the technology right away, or do you cut back slowly? I think the question is to be successful, yes. to be able to get everybody's, no, to do the right thing and to mm -hmm. do it well without having an insurrection in the home. Right, right. You know, is it, I guess it depends on the child, but is it, is there, is there a healthy way of doing it, a more that, Well, yes, there is a healthy way of doing it. And, and, and you're faced with the notion that, depending on where you are in this process, because if your kids are kind of accustomed to doing whatever they want on the internet and whatever, et cetera, et cetera, play whatever games they want, then I think that you need to sit down and have a family council and explain, talk about it, and say, we want as a family to have more time to do other things that are better for us, that will help us go strong physically, that will put out the positive things, you know. And so, and then talk about reducing time and choosing carefully. Does that make sense? Is that, is that what you were, you were asking? Yes. Um, you didn't mention, um, I, I know we are very tight with time tonight, um, Facebook. You know, um, we came from back home and for us it's, at least for me, it's a very good tool to connect with family, with lots of friends that stayed back in Europe and are all over the world. But how, like for people who are here, you know, mm -hmm. or for families and, and stuff, are there any... Um, interesting studies that show how is Facebook addicting, you know, uh, maybe kids and teenagers in how they perceive relationships, how they develop uh, uh, their relational life, and any uh, guidelines uh, on that as well? Yeah. Um, uh, kids really should not be on Facebook under 12 or 13 because, and even then their judgment is not particularly good, 
but that would certainly be the youngest time they should be on Facebook, and they should not be on, and the authorities are saying they should not be on Facebook alone. They should be on Facebook, but you are there. Because there is a lack of judgment. They don't have the judgment about what happens and what people say and, and that type of thing. The judgment isn't there yet. So if you're going to let your child on Facebook that young, then the recommendation is that you be with them all the time. That they not be on Facebook by themselves. Because of the lack of judgment. Uh, this better judgment doesn't kick in uh, until, truly, until around 16, 17. When there is, there is a definite change in the mind and how the mind thinks and this type of thing, and a real maturation that occurs about that age. Uh, and uh, that's not to say it's perfect, but the point is that is the recommendation of authorities in this field, that if you let your child on Facebook that young, you need to be there with them every time they're on Facebook. Okay, let's say they're 20 years old. Okay. <clears throat> let's say they're 20 years old. They're like uh, uh, at college, right? I don't know. That's actually mm -hmm. maybe finishing college, university. Um, when would you say that you know the face Facebook is is becoming addiction to them? It's it's impeding their uh, you know relationships and family with, with friends mm -hmm. and stuff like that. What should be signs? What should be guidelines? And what should be maybe a guideline even at, at that age? How the, how they use it? Okay. Uh, my personal guideline for Facebook is how often I go and look at it, okay? I look at Facebook no oftener than two to three times a week. That's my personal guideline. You can have your personal guideline. You know, if your kid is looking at Facebook, you know, every hour, something needs to happen. Uh, so think through with them how consuming it is in their lives. And, and plus, there are so many instances of kids posting very mean things about other kids on Facebook or on other online activities, but often it's on Facebook. And they say absolutely terrible things about other kids. And, and this is what has happened, is that people, uh, kids growing up today in the high-tech society, uh, many of them have not been taught that, I mean, this, this is faceless. I can't see anything to it because I don't see you. It's just, it's just, you know, typing stuff in there. But this is what we need to teach kids. What you put on there hurts or helps. And you're responsible for how you hurt people. It's very hurtful. Uh, there are recent stories of, of kids who have committed suicide because of what somebody posted there, which is totally uncalled for. Not true, just mean. Our kids need to learn the ground rules. If you can't say something nice, don't say anything. Now you can put on there what you're doing and so forth, and that's okay. But if you can't say something nice to somebody else, don't say anything. Primary rule. The Facebook pages I look at, uh, people I know, uh, nobody is saying nasty things to each other. They're putting on there what they did today or where they traveled, or what, you know, this type of thing. Facts about their lives. But they're not saying mean and nasty things. But younger people, kids, don't have the judgment. And no one has taught them. So no one's saying they can't be on Facebook. Think carefully about the age you let them on. So, again, bridging on what um, Chikanova just said, 
um, if we look at Facebook in terms of in the relational sense, mm -hmm. what point do um, do young adults or children experience fake relationships, and are they are they learning how to experience fake relationships or how to develop real ones? Um, is there what were you going, is that what you're going with? How do you how do you gauge that or prevent or, or I, I missed I missed part of what you said. So Facebook encourages relationships over the w internet. Mm -hmm. So how as a parent do you monitor how your child learns how to develop relationships properly? Like is there an amount of um, Facebook type screen time that has to be uh, kept to a certain level to ensure that their child is learning how to develop proper well, relationships. Well, okay. You you help them you help them develop this by uh, when they first start on Facebook, and you are there with them all the time, and you look at what someone has posted, and you ask a question. Uh, what does that mean? Or whatever question is appropriate, to get them to think about what is on there. And uh, how does the other person feel? Who got that? Those kinds of questions. Because kids today are not developing empathy. The research is showing that very, very clearly. They do not have empathy. They're, not, they're, they're very lacking in empathy. And it's, it's largely because so many of those relationships are, are not face-to-face -face relationships. When you are face-to-face, -face, I can read your face. You can read mine. You can read my body language. You can read my eyes. My total person can't do that on any of the online things. And they're not developing empathy. They're very poor in empathy. I just wanted to go back to uh, the part where you said that, you know, a family that decides to take away technology and connect on a personal level. And I find it um, just like talking to my coworkers, I remember them giving me advice that, you know, um, TV is going to be your savior because if you want to get something done, you know, you can just put the kid and just put a movie on. Uh, and then, that's the problem. <laughs> and I, I find that if we take away the technology, why I think... Um, we might not want to say no is because then you have to fill the time with something else and that something else mm -hmm. might be uh, your involvement. So you having to do something with a kid. That's and right. I think it's being okay with um, maybe not having a perfectly clean house and not having everything perfect but um, not necessarily depending on the TV to get things done. And I know with my friends that's a, that's a, that's yeah. a big thing. That's exactly right. That's exactly what many parents are doing today. Because it's available and it's easy and it's quick. But the truth is that in the long haul, it'll be, the, the house will not matter. And I'm a, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a reasonably careful housekeeper. But I don't go around there and, and look up for one little speck somewhere. And our house is reasonably organized, and it was when the kids were growing up. But I think there are other things that are more important. So hang in there. <laughs> I can just slightly add from my personal experience because I grew up roughly like you just described, having a TV mainly as a babysitter. And even today, I'm having great challenges just to get rid of it. So just you could ignore it, ignore it. Ignore it, that's right. Because ignore. it's long, I would say, um, battle throughout your life to get rid of it. And it's tough. It's like any other, any other addiction you, you have. You know, the TV doesn't have to be on all the time. The real, the real truth about TV is that you look at the schedule. The ideal way to do this is to look at the schedule, decide on some programs that are good programs, and watch them. But there are ever so many families in which the TV is on all day long as a background. You know. So it, it's, it's a matter, we need to take control. We live in a digital world. We need to take control as much as we can. For ourselves and our own benefit and for our kids. Well, thank you so much for coming and participating. And you've been a great, great group. And we will look forward to see you tomorrow. Shall we close with prayer?
You go ahead. Go ahead. I can. Heavenly Father, we are grateful tonight that you have given us guidelines, that you love us, that you care about us, that you care about each one of our children. We want to follow some guidelines. We want to be proactive in our homes and, in our, and with our children in this world that we live in. So help us to find the good in technology and to know what to do about the not so good and how to help our children and ourselves. Give us each of us a safe trip home and back again tomorrow. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. to get rid of a few things on me. Mm -hmm. So tomorrow at 11, it takes home in church. Yeah. Okay. This was fun with a smaller group.